All right, thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody coming out. Um, Ancient City Ruby was actually the first conference I attended two years ago in 2013, so it's a really big treat to be back uh, this year and pre present for the first time. So this is actually the first time I've presented at a conference, so, so do bear with me. Uh, my name, as he said, is Jay Hayes. You can find me all over the internet at I am very. Uh, also at IamVary.com, a personal blog. I try to write about technical stuff, you know. Uh, and this is my beautiful wife. I'd have to give a shout out to her because she is amazing. Um, she actually owns a dance studio and runs an amazing business. So I'm, I'm so proud of her. Um, this is actually one of our productions that we uh, put on last year, maybe the year before. We had a lot of fun. So gotta, gotta plug my wife, she's awesome. Uh, right now I'm working at Big Nerd Ranch. Uh, we teach immersive boot camps. Uh, where we'll actually go off and this, have this sort of monastic learning experience. We also do consulting, build great web apps, iOS apps, Android, uh, and then write some really good books. I've got a couple books with me, so if somebody can find me and ask for them, I, I'm happy to give you one. Uh, but I personally work on the backend team and I write Ruby code. I love the language and I'm really excited about it. It's what got me excited about programming. Uh, and what's neat is experiencing Swift. There's some sort of parallels and, and similarly exciting things about the Swift language uh, that, that have sort of drawn me in, and so I want to share those with you today. So we are going to talk about Swift today, but the way we'll do it, we'll present some, some things we love about Ruby and then see sort of what the parallels are and what similar implementations might look like in Swift. I have to give you a word of warning, though. Swift is very much in development right now, and it was, it was sort of hard to create uh, examples that stayed up to date because as I was working on them, they would release a new beta of the language that would break all my examples. As far as I know, the current beta works uh, well with the examples that I have, and I'll give links to those, but I do know that it's a rapidly changing language, it's evolving and growing, and um, currently Apple is very much in control of that. Maybe they'll open source it one day. If you're interested in learning more about Swift, you can go to the Apple website. They have got, they've got some free books that are uh, really good resources for learning, um, and there's also a blog and, and other things, so check that out. All right, here we go. Let's buckle up. We'll activate discovery mode. The way this, this uh, talk is put together is we'll have certain slides that are co sort of color coded. The red slides, the ones with the red background are Ruby examples, and the ones with the orange text or orange background are Swift examples. That'll kind of help orient you as we go along. But first, before we get into these examples, we sort of need to lay some groundwork. So I'm, I'm guessing that not many people have used Swift. Is there anybody that's used Swift so far? A few of you? Okay, cool. Uh, several of you. So bear with me as I uh, lay sort of some groundwork. We'll show some very simple constructs and then hopefully get into some more interesting examples. Okay, so first up, the variable. One of the most basic parts of any language. A variable is a, an identifier that allows reassignment. Uh, we use these in pretty much all programming languages that we deal with. Some don't have variables, some only deal in constants, but Swift does allow uh, variables. This is a variable in Swift. So you declare a variable with a var keyword followed by an identifier. And then in this case, we specify the type of the variable as a string. And then we initialize it to the literal uh, string of my first name. Later, you can go and change the value of the variable. It allows reassignment. And so if we print that variable afterwards, you can see that it prints the, the, the new value for the string. But variables also allow mutation. So if you have a mutable type, such as an array of integers, you can use a mutating function like the append function to add another element to that array. Not much of a surprise, if we print the array to the screen, you'll see uh, that new element's included in the, the printed output. So another type in Swift is a constant, or I shouldn't say type, another uh, type of value or another value in Swift is a constant. And this is also very similar to what we use in Ruby constants, and that is they prevent reassignment. So if we have a constant defined with the let keyword, and this one's of type double and set to some uh, literal uh, double value, if we try to increment that constant, which is a, an assignment operation, uh, it, it won't allow it. It'll actually say you can't reassign uh, to the constant pi because it's a constant and that, that prevents reassignment. But unlike Ruby, constants also prevent mutation. So in Ruby, if we create a constant with some value we, and it's a mutable type, we can mutate that value. Uh, we'll often freeze those values in Ruby if we want to prevent the mutation, but Swift does it for us uh, at a language level. So if we have that same array of integers and we declare a constant with the let keyword and try to call that mutating function, it'll actively prevent that because having that uh, value assigned to a constant will prevent the mutating function from, from working at all. So very unlike Ruby, Swift is a type safe language and that is it's actively working to prevent type errors. So here's a, a similar example that we first saw. It's a variable of uh, that's called name and it's a string type and we assign some string value initially. If we later try to assign it a non-string value, that's an error because 42 is not a string, it's an integer. Uh, also, if we have an array of integers and we try to append a non-integer type to that array, 
same thing, error because a, the string j is not an integer, it can't be contained uh, by the array of integers. And then last, I want to talk about type inference. So type inference is a way of putting the Swift compiler or Swift language to work for you. Um, it's a little robust having to declare types for all the values that you're creating. So we can use inference so that we can avoid those declarations in a lot of cases and write a little more concise code. So here's an example of type inference. That same con constant pi, we can just leave the type off. And since we're assigning it a literal value, a literal double value, um, this assertion is true because the t uh, Swift infers that type to be uh, a double value. All right, so that, that's the groundwork. That's all the, the little things that we need to talk about the language. We can now build on that and see some Ruby examples. So here's the examples we'll go through. We'll talk about short circuiting, keyword arguments, the symbol to proc, truthiness, and then finally hash fetch, which is a, a method that I really love in the Ruby language. So number one, short circuit. If you don't know what that means immediately, this is a short circuit operation in Ruby. And the idea is that every statement in Ruby returns some value. Um, and it also builds on the, the fact that values have a, an intrinsic truthiness or falsiness about them. So like false and nil are falsy values. If they're used with an operator, they'll, eva they'll evaluate to, fal uh, to false and therefore cause uh, the or operator to circuit to the end. So in the first example, if we have a variable that's nil and use it with the or operator, this statement will evaluate to the right side of the or operator because nil is a falsy value. And in the case of the second example, if we have some truthy value, a string, and we use it with the or operator, it'll short circuit and just return that, that value uh, from the, the or operator there. Okay, to do this in Swift or to find a similar construct in Swift, we have to establish some new concepts. We'll talk about optionals, optional binding, and the coalescing operator, which is the sort of, it's not really an equivalent, but it, it has a very similar feel uh, in Swift to how, to how it looks in Ruby. So first, optionals. How do we represent the absence of value in Swift? You might think, I'll just leave the, the variable uninitialized. Well, that's an error in Swift. You can't reference a variable that hasn't been initialized. It doesn't initialize to nil automatically. Uh, there's actually a special uh, concept in Swift to represent the absence of value. So in this case, if we tried to represent or uh, reference that variable but without being initialized, an error would occur uh, and, and your, your program would crash. So in Swift, this is called an optional. And this, Concept comes from other languages. It's, it's available in some other languages. This is what it looks like in Swift. An optional is declared by uh, specifying a type followed by a question mark. And that question mark ind indicates that this is a wrapped optional type. So if we try to reference that optional variable that hasn't been initialized, it's just nil by default. If we then initialize it to some value, we have to explicitly unwrap that optional uh, to get that value out. And I must warn you, that explicit unwrap operator, that's a dangerous operation. If you try to do that to a value that is nil, an error will occur and your program crashes. So this is actually not a safe way of referencing an option or, or uh, unwrapping an optional value uh, that is an optional variable. So to do that safely, there's a concept in Swift known as optional binding. Uh, it's used with an if condition or an if statement. The right side of this assignment is the optional variable. It is then, if, if that is not nil, that optional variable is bound to the constant on the left side and made available in the block following the if statement. But if it's not available, if it is nil, nothing is bound on the left, nothing is bound to that constant, and so the entire body of this if statement would be skipped. Okay, finally, the coalescing operator. So this is sort of the Swift equivalent, if you will, of our short circuiting operation that we, we like to do in Ruby. This is what it looks like in Swift. And you might have remembered that original slide. The this, this similarity is kind of striking here. If we have an optional variable that hasn't been initialized and we use it with this coalescing operator, the double question mark, then it will evaluate whatever's on the right side of that as the return value of this statement. Otherwise, if we have some value set for our optional and use it with a coalescing operator, it'll short circuit and just return the unwrapped version of that optional, the unwrapped value of that optional as a result of the statement. So here again is the example in Ruby. And the example in Swift, and you can see they're very, very similar. Uh, there's different semantics about it because this is a very type-specific thing, and this depends on some uh, features of the Ruby language, but I think the parallels is pretty striking. Okay, number two, keyword arguments. So in Ruby, as of, I think, 2.0, we have this new concept known as keyword arguments. It's sort of a formalized way of specifying like a, um, a, a hash of arguments to a, a function but you have to explicitly say which uh, keys will be uh, externalized outside of the, the method call. So this is an example of declaring a required keyword argument named bar and a, an optional keyword argument that has a default value baz and just puts it to the screen. So if we use this method 
we would use it something like this. We might call it with some value for bar because that's a required keyword argument. We could also override the value of Baz and provide some a new value that's not, uh, not the default, overriding that default. And then also in Ruby, we can reorder these keyword arguments. So they're order independent, we can supply them in any order. So to accomplish something like this in Swift, we have to establish some new concepts. First, functions. We'll see what functions look like. Second, we'll talk about external parameters. And this is sort of the Swift equivalent of uh, creating parameters that can be named from outside uh, of the function call. So first up, functions. Here's a very simple function in Swift. We declare a function with a func keyword, followed by the name of the function, foo in this case. And then we're, we'll define a function that's very similar to the Ruby function we just saw, or Ruby method we just saw. This, this function has two parameters, bar and baz, and they're declared in a set of parentheses. The first one is required. It doesn't have a default value. It's of type string. The second parameter is baz. It does have a default value, and it's also of type string. And then we'll just print them together. We also get a, a, a little hint here. A Swift, in, it supports string interpolation, so we like to use that in Ruby also. I won't actually talk about string interpolation too much, but you can see that it's available, and this is the syntax if you're interested in using that. So here's some example use of that function. So we could call it providing some value for the bar parameter, which is the first parameter. We could also uh, override that default keyword argument, the second parameter, the external parameter, baz, um, and it'll print those things to the screen. But you might notice by this slide, there's no external name for that first parameter, and that's because it's not an external parameter. So that's what we'll talk about next, external parameters. So here's how we make an ex a parameter external in Swift. We have to specify an external parameter name for that parameter. And in this case, we have the exact same name uh, as the internal parameter name. They can be different, but in this case, we're specifying one that's exactly the same. So there's a special syntax for that. You can just use a hash mark. You can prefix the internal parameter name with a hash mark, and, and that'll make it external with the exact same name it has internal. And so that's it. So now, here's how we might use that function with external names. You can see the first example is, is bit for bit the same uh, as Ru the Ruby example. The second one is two overriding the Baz default argument. And the third one, we attempt to reorder it, but what we find out is para uh, name parameters, external uh, parameters in Swift are order dependent, so you can't reorder them in Swift. Now, I have to caveat that and say there is a way to do it, but um, the, the function parameter semantics are really kind of weird in Swift right now. I'm, I'm hoping that they'll change them. So I'm not gonna go into all those details and all the rules that play with those, but just in this case, I'm gonna wave my hands and say, uh, you can't reorder these, this will create an error. Here again is the Ruby example, and of course it's a character for character the exact same, but with the exception that the last one in Ruby is valid where the last one in Swift is invalid. Number three, symbol to proc. So in Ruby, if we have, for example, an array of lowercase characters, we can map that array providing a symbol as the block argument to the, the map method, and it'll use that symbol, it'll actually create a proc behind the scenes to map those to uppercase. And what that proc looks like behind the scenes is something sort of like this. Uh, a proc is created with the yielded value being publicly sent the symbol itself as the message. And if we use that proc, uh, with the mapping function as the block argument, that can also be used uh, to, to map to uppercase. So this would be sort of a more verbose way of doing a similar thing uh, to the, the symbol to proc. So in Swift, we need to establish some new concepts. We'll introduce closures, followed by functions as arguments. So first, closures. A closure in, in Swift is a lot like a, a block proc in Lambda in Ruby, um, and that is that they're anonymous functions. They're functions that aren't, aren't explicitly named. This is what an, a closure will look like in Swift. Uh, it's got, you'll see a closure is, is defined by opening a set of curly braces, and then you can assign it to some variable or constant or whatever to be called later. Uh, and then you specify the parameters right after the curly braces in front of this in keyword. In this case, it takes a single parameter, name, that's of type string, and then just prints a, a greeting to the screen. And you call the closure with a set of parentheses, just like uh, you would call a function or, or a method on a, an object or whatever. Not too complicated. But we can actually use closures with existing functions in Swift. So here we have a, a Swift array of lowercase characters. And we can use the map method that's defined on the Swift array type along with the closure. And this has a very similar feel uh, to the Ruby equivalent. And, and it's, it's kind of nice because we, I think we really enjoy doing this sort of thing in Ruby. We to maybe use do end in this case. Uh, there's different styles there, but um, you must use uh, curly braces in Swift. So we can uh, provide a closure uh, to the map method uh, it yields a it yields or passes into that closure call a, a letter that's in the array, and then something is done with it. In this case, we're calling uppercase string on it. 
um, you'll notice that that parameter doesn't specify the type. So we're actually taking advantage of the Swift type inference in this case. Uh, the letter parameter to that closure can be inferred as type string because the array that we defined is an array of strings. So you don't have to specify. That inference happens and you can just leave the type off. And if you want to make it even more concise, there's a special syntax in Swift for that. And that's using these index parameters. So they have, a Swift has to have parameters because of the type system that exists. But as a convenience, it'll provide these index parameters that you can use. Now, this robs from the expressiveness of the statement a little bit. But in certain cases, in this particular case, a very, very small closure, I think this reads as a, a, a very expressive statement. It's easy to understand that I'm referencing the first uh, parameter or the first element in that uh, closure and sending it the uppercase uh, function, calling the uppercase method. All right. Functions as arguments. So in Swift, just like all other values, functions also have a type. So we'll see that if we define a function named upcase, and uh, it, it is just a, a mapping function that sort of maps a string to a string, returning the uppercase version of it, the type of this function is a string mapped to a string. And so if we have a case where uh, a required interface is that type, we can use it. So in the case of the map function, um, the required interface is that the, each uh, method call returns a string. So we can map, use that uppercase function that we defined uh, with the map method to map those to uppercase, just like that. And unfortunately, this is as close as we can get to symbol proc, uh, symbol to proc in Swift. And that's a little bit of a bummer. And the reason for that is there's not a, much of a reflection API built into Swift yet. Um, I think you can dip into Objective-C and do some things similar to this, but right now, this is actually as close as we can get in Swift to symbol to proc. So I, I kind of led you along a little bit there, um, but here again is that Ruby example, that, and this would be the equivalent uh, Ruby example where you have to define verbosely some callable uh, to be used as a block or closure to that, uh, to the map function. All right, number four, truthiness. So in Ruby, we like doing things like this, and we might not code a literal zero, but what this relies on is uh, all integers in Ruby have a, a truthiness to them. They're all uh, truthy by default. So it, it's a little startling if you haven't used Ruby, if you're coming from other languages like JavaScript, zero is a falsy value in JavaScript. In Ruby, all integers are a truthy value. So this statement would evaluate and print a line to the screen. Um, in Swift, that's not the case. Swift has a very strict type system, as I've, I've noted. So you can't do something like this in Swift, so we'll talk about how you can get there. So first we'll talk about a conditional, very basic stuff. Uh, the, the protocol, we'll get there. And then talk about extensions, which is how we can add behavior to existing types in Swift. So first, the conditional. So all I want to say here is that in Swift, a valid conditional is a value that is of, of a Boolean. Or more specifically, it adopts the Boolean type protocol. So what is a protocol? A protocol in Swift is like an interface. Uh, in other languages, you might have used interfaces in Java or, or C++ or whatever. Um, if you've used Objective-C, you'll know exactly what a protocol is because they carry this concept directly over from the Objective-C world. But a protocol just defines an API for an object, but it doesn't provide any implementation. It's just, it's like a contract. So the true, the, the, tr the literal true Boolean in Swift is a, uh, a Boolean type, but it also adopts the Boolean type protocol. Um, so in order to use a different value here, we would need to adopt the Boolean type protocol to make it uh, valid uh, as a condition to an if statement. So we can actually do that in Swift using a feature known as extensions. And extensions are, are sort of the equivalent to reopening classes in Ruby, which sometimes we do for better or sometimes for worse. Um, but the idea is that you can add behavior to existing types or existing uh, elements in the, in the language itself. And we can do that in Swift too. Um, and the, the interesting thing is even, it, uh, there, even the default types are not off limit in Swift. So you can extend base types in Swift just like you can extend your own types. So here's an extension in Swift. It's a very simple extension in this case. It's created using the extension keyword followed by the type that we're extending. So we're going to extend the integer type in this case. And then optionally, you can provide a list of protocols that this extension is adopting on that type. So the Boolean type protocol has one requirement. It requires a public uh, property to, to be defined named Boolean value. And in this case, we just return true because we want our, in this case, we want our Swift uh, integers to behave just like our Ruby integers in that um, all integers are sort of truthy uh, in nature. So with this extension, we can now use an integer as the Boolean. And you can carry that concept to any type uh, in the language if you want to use them in conditions. 
So here again is the Ruby example, and you can see it's very, very similar uh, to the Swift example, just some syntactic differences in the language. All right, last example, hash fetch. So if you're not familiar with the fetch method, it's a really, really cool method um, that, we, that we love to use in the Ruby language. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, I, I was turned to it more recently by uh, listening and watching and following Avdi Grimm online. Um, the, sort of the beauty of the fetch method is that it requires you to cover all cases of getting a value from a hash. So if you use the subscript operator on a hash, you might, it might return nil. And we've all seen the no method error raised out of our programs and causing things to crash where a nil will sneak in. This will require you to cover all the possible results of getting a value from a hash and sort of protect you against those nil things unless you do something crazy like return nil as the default value from fetch. So here's an example of using that fetch method uh, with a hash in Ruby. So we start by defining a very simple hash with a single uh, key, the symbol one spelled out and it has the value of one. When we fetch from that hash a known key or a key that's present, it'll just return the value associated to it in the hash. If we fetch some missing key, a key error is raised. And this is great because it forces us to handle that. We have to do something with that key error uh, to, to provide a sane execution uh, in the case of a missing value. Alternatively, you, there's an optional second argument to the hash uh, method that will return a default, so you can define some default value that's returned in the case of a missing key. And then often preferable is to use the, the block form that requires you to provide a block that when evaluated will result in a value that is used for a default for a missing key. So I, I think that's generally the preferred way to do things. Um, one of the reasons for that, like if you wanted, if you were fetching from a hash some key that might also return a hash, if you just put that hash here, it'll always return that same instance of the hash rather than evaluating uh, a new instance of the hash every time you fetch a missing key. And that can cause some really weird bugs if you're not careful. Okay, in Swift, we need to learn some new concepts as we have the whole time. The first is a dictionary. And the dictionary is sort of the Swift equivalent of a hash. It's a it's sort of key value store. Then we'll talk about forced internal parameters. And that's a way of, of taking away the externalness of a parameter in a method or function call. Then we'll talk about optional chaining. And this is a way of safely calling uh, or chaining operations to optional values. And then finally, we'll talk about the fatal error. And the fatal error is just a way of causing the program to crash if we don't know how to handle anymore. So first up, the dictionary. Here's a dictionary in Swift. Nothing too new here. We declare it with, uh, instead of curly braces like we would do in Ruby, we actually use the same sort of uh, square brackets. And we define keys and values separated by a colon. Um, this will infer the type of a dictionary with a key value of string and the, the value value of, or the key type of string, I should have said, and the value type of integer. And then in Ruby, here at the bottom, you can see is the um, sort of equivalent, but it's a little different because in Ruby, there's no restrictions on what types we use for keys, what types we use for values. We just kind of assume you'll do things right, um, which can be dangerous. So next, a forced internal parameter. So like I said, in in Ruby, that second argument to the Swift, uh, I'm sorry, that in Ruby, the second argument to the fetch method uh, is, doesn't have an external name. It's not a keyword argument. So in order to do that in Swift, you have to force that parameter to be internal. We're wanting this example to look and feel very much like the Ruby equivalent. So we, we need to talk briefly about the method parameter semantics. So if you have a method in Swift, the second parameter is always externalized. So we need to force that to be internal. Here's an example class and a method, and we won't talk about too much about the class construct, but you declare a class with a class keyword, give it a type. It is, it is a formal type with, uh, with no super type. It's a, a base type in Swift. Um, we create a method on that class with a func keyword, similar to creating a function globally outside of a class. Uh, this one has the name bar, takes two parameters, baz and cucks, and then prints some, the, some of them to the screen. And so you see if we create a new instance of a foo type and call the bar method on that, you have to provide that external name for the second parameter, and we don't want to do that. We want it to be internal so that it matches uh, the, the signature of our Ruby hash fetch method. So internalizing is pretty simple. Very little change here, except a key little underscore right there. And so if you provide the special external name of a parameter as an underscore in Swift, that'll force that parameter to be internal. And so now when we call at the bottom the 
the bar method, it, it's internal. And that's all there is to it. Not, not anything too crazy there, but we need to know how to force those internal. Okay, next, optional chaining. So, you know, I had mentioned in Swift, if you have an optional value and you explicitly unwrap it with the bang operator, that's dangerous. It can cause your program to crash. This is a way of doing that a little safely, but in a concise way that doesn't require the optional binding in such a verbose uh, syntax. So an optional chain looks like this. If you have an optional value with no value, it's, it's nil, you can call methods with this question mark in front of them, which is kind of weird. But what that does is if string, if this variable has a value, if this optional has a value, it'll just be unwrapped and returned right there. If it does, it, I'm sorry, if it has a value, it'll be unwrapped and call the following code, everything to the right after it, on that, that value. But if it's not, nil is returned. So you can see in this case, we print uh, the optional with that chain on the end, nil is just returned and nothing is printed to the screen, or nil is printed to the screen. If that optional does have a value, such as oh hi, and we print it with the optional chain, since it does have a value, that value will be unwrapped and the uppercase string will be called on the value. Now you'll note that the result of this is actually the optional, and that's because optional chaining always rewraps the result of the method call in another optional. And they do this so that you can chain as many as you want on that. And that sounds like a really bad idea. That sounds like a horrible violation of the law of Demeter. Um, I, I felt that way, some of the friends of mine also feel that way. Um, so I would say use optional chaining, uh, pra practice it with, uh, you know, be very careful with it. It, it can lead to um, some pretty bad violations of Demeter, but uh, in this case, it's a, it's a good concise way of calling that without having to check statements uh, with ifs and all that so, sort of stuff, and it'll actually help us later on in the, the fetch implementation as well. Okay, finally is the fatal error. Um, it's a very simple function. It's a public or a global function. Um, you just call fatal error with some string, and execution will end. The program crashes. And you might think, oh, that's not good. We don't want our program to crash. We want to raise some error we can catch. Um, well, in Swift, <laughs> good news, everyone. There are no exceptions in Swift. There's just errors. The program just crashes. You actually can't recover from this. Um, there may be uh, an exception library or, or uh, things built into the language in the future. I don't know at this point. But uh, right now, this is actually all we can do. We have to assume that if you send, you need to be very confident uh, with the key that you're fetching out of your dictionary because if you fetch one that doesn't exist, the program execution ends. So here it is. We will go through it a piece at a time. It's not that bad. It looks kind of crazy, but it's not that bad. We start by opening or extending the dictionary type to define a fetch method on the dictionary type. That fetch method has three parameters, a key, a default value, and then the de I called it the default valuer, may not be a great name, but it's the closure that can be evaluated to uh, determine the default in, in the case of a missing key. You'll notice a couple types here that we haven't seen before, the key type and the value type. These are actually generic types that are defined on the dictionary uh, type, and they represent whatever key type and whatever value type were declared with that particular instance of a dictionary. You also notice that the value, the default value, is an optional. And that's so that we don't have to specify a default value. We want to be able to call, we have several different signatures for this method. We want to be able to call the fetch method without a default value, um, and it, and it it'll allow that. So we declare it as an optional, defaulted to nil. You also notice that the default value is forced internal. And this just allows us to uh, pass that parameter, that second parameter, without an external name. Wanting to match the Ruby uh, hash fetch method. And then finally, the third parameter is the default valuer. The type of this parameter is a closure, has no parameters in, in coming. There are no parameters uh, given to that closure. And the output is a value. So after that closure is evaluated, it must return a, a, the type, the same type uh, as the, the key uh, type in the dictionary. And you should also note that it's an optional. So this is a, a closure type, but it's an optional closure type. And that's so that we don't have to specify a closure when we call this method. It's optional um, to, to meet that uh, robust, I guess you would say, type signature of the fetch method. Now, after you call the fetch method, you're going to get a value. You're guaranteed to get a value, some value, or the error, of course. Um, but we won't return an optional. We always get some value uh, from the fetch method call. 
So this is the body of the method. It's actually just kind of just two lines. Um, first, we attempt to bind all these different optionals, either from the dictionary itself, from the default value passed in, or from the closure being evaluated, and then return that. And if it can't, then we, uh, we raise an error. The, you'll notice that we're using the coalescing operator here to sort of chain along those different optionals. The first, uh, the first try is just subscript. Just, we'll just subscript into the dictionary and try to fetch that key. Now the subscript operator in Swift, uh, it returns an optional. And that's because a dictionary may not contain the key that we're subscripting. But since we're using the, uh, the coalescing operator, that would evaluate first. And if it did contain a value, it, that value would be bound to the constant uh, in this uh, optional binding on the left. Now if it didn't, it, evaluation would continue to the right side of the coalescing operator and the default value also an optional. If it's present, it would be then bound to the, the value on the left, the constant on the left. If it's not there, then execution would continue to the next, the right of the next uh, coalescing operator. And finally, try to execute the default value or closure. Now you'll notice this weird little question mark in the middle, that's that optional chaining. So since the default value might be nil as an optional, we need to chain the, the uh, parenthesis onto the end of it and call those only if that value is present. And if it is present, you remember we talked, uh, the optional chaining always returns an optional so that we can bind the result of that optional back over to the constant uh, on the left. And if any of those in that chain evaluate to some value other than nil, some optional value other than nil, then it would be returned by the block following the condition, or following the if statement. Otherwise, there's no way to find the, the value, a, a default value, so we just error out and execution ends. Oh, yeah, so I was pointing at all those things. <laughs> so there it is, the entire dictionary fetch uh, method defined in Swift. Um, it's really not that bad. I, I, was, I was intrigued that it was quite a simple uh, thing to define, really. Um, one thing that I did want to note is we could also define this as multiple, since we have a type system in Swift, we could define multiple fetch methods on dictionary that all have the signature required. Instead of using these uh, default values and optionals and stuff as parameters, we could just have one that only has a key that would raise an error if that key's not found. Um, but I, in this case, I really liked being able to exploit some of the different things that we had learned about the language and see them in action uh, for, for our implementation of the fetch method. Here's how it's used. We have a dictionary, has keys and values. We can fetch a known key, it's returned. If we fetch an unknown key, an error occurs. That's that fatal error. Um, if we fetch an unknown key with a default value, it returns the default that we define. And then if we fetch an unknown key with a closure, evaluating to that value, it'll just return uh, the evaluated value from the closure. And it, it's pretty neat to see how close this is to the, the same, uh, the similar thing in Ruby. Here's the hash fetch method. Really, the only difference is the, uh, the, the hash definition is just syntactically slightly different. So that's it, we made it. <laughs> um, he's, he's very happy and hurt. Um, okay, so this is what we learned in Swift today. We learned about values and types and optionals and conditions and functions, uh, parameters, protocols. There's actually a lot more, obviously. We didn't talk about custom types. We briefly saw classes in Swift and there's, there's different semantics between value types and reference types in Swift. And that's, that's all um, things that you can learn more about uh, on the Apple website. So definitely check that out. I kind of feel like I'm pushing Apple a little bit, but uh, it's not my intention. I think uh, Swift is a neat language. I've had a lot of fun um, playing with Swift as a language. I haven't, uh, interestingly, I haven't really done any iOS stuff with it. I've just been playing with it as a language um, kind of outside of their whole um, app development ecosystem. Uh, also, again, want to mention, you know, we, we teach boot camps on this stuff at Big Nerd Ranch. Um, they're a lot of fun. If you like, we kind of go off in the woods and try to disconnect everyone from the internet and just focus on learning for a week. Um, I also blog about this. Um, and and it's, the blog is sort of similar to the talk in that it shows Ruby examples and their equivalents in Swift, but they go into a little different direction. Uh, so definitely check that, if, that out if you're interested. Um, and I also did a, a talk at a local meetup on Swift, and this is, the talk was more about just language stuff. It didn't compare it to Ruby. It was just, here's Swift, here's what you can do. So if you're interested in Swift, this may be a good resource to check out. Um, and with that, that's all I have to say. So thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to entertain questions. If you all want to ask questions, if you have any questions, I'll tweet slides and, and examples and all that stuff if you want to look at them. Yeah, what's up? So uh, I noticed that, that in, in, you had to do a course internal for, for, the, for, the, for functions past like, the first argument. Does that mean that by default you can only have one internal, for, like, internal argument and the rest have to be external? So by default, 
on methods, which the distinction between methods and functions, for whatever reason, Swift calls uh, functions defined on objects or structs or whatever methods. So the, it just means it's a, a function that belongs to some type. Um, the default semantic is the first parameter is internal. All other parameters are external. You can force all of those to be internal, but they're all external. So you have to do it explicitly. You have to do it explicitly. And the reason that I think they did that that way, at least at this point, is it's very similar to Objective-C, and that Objective-C, the first parameter to a function or method or whatever, is internal, so that you can name your functions like do with this and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't like it. I, my opinion right now is that they should just internal all parameters and let you opt into the external thing. And, and another reason for that is when you d define a default value for a parameter, um, I didn't go too much into it, but if you define a default value, that will force it external unless you force it back internal. So um, the difference is that in functions, which are blocks of code defined outside of uh, of a class or a struct or a type or whatever, functions have all internal parameters by default. They actually do. Um, but the example that I showed, the second one was an external parameter because it was a, had a default value. And that was, that was just really bizarre to me that just defining a default value makes it external because reasons. You know, it just didn't feel really straightforward. Another thing that's weird is if you uh, define default values, all of a sudden you get uh, parameter reordering just because. I don't know why. So I, again, I, I feel like if you're going to give me reorder, like the ability to reorder parameters, just do it all the time. Don't make it just happen because I defined a default value. That's a weird semantic. So, anybody else? Oh, yeah. What's up? Um, have you used Ruby Motion at all? I have not actually. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, <laughs> I just wanted to know what, like, if there was you could draw a comparison. So from what I've heard about Ruby Motion, I, I haven't done a whole lot of, of uh, iOS work really. I'm just really just playing with this as a language. Um, but what I've heard about Ruby Motion is you kind of have to know all the Objective C stuff to use it very effectively. The thing, of course, that I, I'm most like drawn by the idea of Ruby Motion is the ability to to like breakpoint your iOS code and execute like a REPL in line. That seems really cool, uh, but I, I haven't used it personally. So uh, I also noticed that. Yeah, um, if you don't do that, so that, that I, I noticed that and I thought that was a little unintuitive. Um, if you don't do that, Swift will complain and say you have to provide a value for this, uh, this parameter because it doesn't have a value. So unlike uh, variables that are defined as optionals, it doesn't assume nil in the case of a missing parameter. You have to provide a value. So since it was, uh, since it was a parameter to a method, we provided nil as the default and that, that made it happy. Could you provide another value and then yeah, that's true. I guess you could provide you could provide anything. All right. Oh. Um, just curious, do you take advantage of whenever you can making custom types and sort of to bring abstractions into your code? You know, us in previous we that anything type language don't have that, but with the language that offers Yeah, so the question was, um, do you take advantage of custom types and I guess protocols and all these things in Swift? Um, I, I haven't done enough with it to say, yes, I, I've done this, but I think absolutely that would be uh, how you would approach the language. Um, in, in Ruby, we take advantage of the dynamic nature where we don't have to worry so much about types and as long as it meets, has some method response to that, we can call it. In Swift, it won't let you uh, pass you know, some value as a parameter to that method if it doesn't uh, if it doesn't adopt some particular protocol or type. So yeah, you would want to, you'd probably want to establish some suite of protocols or whatever um, for those types. I, you, you need to be careful not to get carried away up front um, because it's tempting to do that in a typed language like, like Swift, but, but yeah, absolutely. You would, you would need to take advantage of types to establish those contracts with whatever objects you're interacting with there. Cool, thank you so much.